Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at silylpyrrole oxidation en route to saxitoxin congeners, including 11 saxitoxin ethanoic acid. This work was published by the Dubois Group in Jock in 2021 and is part of their wider research project into the synthesis of saxitoxins and other compounds that act on voltage-gated sodium ion channels. The saxitoxins are a large family of bisguanidinium natural products that are isolated from marine dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria and are known to cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. These compounds act by inhibiting the flow of ions through voltage-gated sodium ion channels in a similar manner to tetrodotoxin, another guanidinium compound which we looked at recently. These guanidinium groups present a challenge in the synthesis of this molecule. In addition to the three contiguous stereocenters, which are found in the tricyclic fused ring system, the high degree of complexity and relatively small size of this molecule make it an interesting challenge for total synthesis. And in this video, we'll see how this synthesis was achieved. So let's start by looking at the retrosynthesis. The first disconnections occur at the geminal diol and the pendant carbamate group. The diol could be constructed using an isomerization of an alpha beta unsaturated ester and the carbamate could be installed using carbonyl diamidazole. The unsaturated ester required for this isomerization could be introduced using a horner wadsworth emmons reaction of a ketone. This ketone will be introduced using a Brook rearrangement triggered by the oxidation of a silyl group. The precursor for this reaction could be generated using another rearrangement, in this case a mislow evans rearrangement, following the necessary thioacetylization and oxidation. To introduce the acetate group, necessary to form the key nitrogen carbon bond to complete the five membered guanidine ring, they could use an oxidative dearomatization reaction of a substituted pyrrole. This pyrrole will be functionalized using a Pictet Spengler reaction, with the guanidine group introduced using simple substitution chemistry. The urea precursor could be synthesized from a simple brominated pyrrole using carboxylation and amidation chemistry using a serine derivative. So let's start with the synthesis. Reaction of the brominated pyrrole with N-butyl lithium forms a nucleophile that was reacted with a range of organocyl chloride groups. Four different groups were used, trimethylsilyl, terputyl dimethylsilyl, phenyl dimethylsilyl, and triisopropylsilyl. The difference in the reactivity of these molecules will be seen later in the synthesis. Taking these forward, the n triisopropylsilyl group was selectively deprotected using potassium fluoride, and this was then deprotonated using potassium terbutoxide, forming an anion that was reacted with carbon dioxide, producing a carbamic acid upon workup with a 58% yield over three steps. To chlorinate this molecule, they used the Vilsmeer Hack reagent. The reaction of dimethylformamide with oxalic chloride displaces the chloride, which acts as a nucleophile, towards the activated aminium species, and this causes the decomposition of the oxalyl fragment, eliminating carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and chloride. This imidazolium chloride species is the active chlorinating reagent. It first acts as an electrophile, where it is attacked by the acid, forming an intermediate that eliminates chloride. This chloride then acts as a nucleophile and forms the acyl chloride, together with the regeneration of DMF. This acyl chloride was then reacted directly with L-serine methoxyester. This formed the urea in a 74% yield, and this was then protected with terbutyl diphenyl chloride. Taking this compound forward, it was then reduced using dibal. The hydride acts as a nucleophile towards the ester, which then eliminates methoxide and selectively forms the aldehyde without further reduction to the alcohol. This aldehyde was necessary for the pictet spengler reaction. Reaction of the aldehyde with allylamine under the influence of boron trifluoride first forms an imine, which is activated by coordination to boron trifluoride, making it more electrophilic and allows it to be attacked by the pyrrole ring, forming a new carbon-carbon bond. This produced the product in a 32-53% to yield, depending on the silyl group which was used, with the larger terbutyl dimethyl silyl and phenyl dimethyl silyl groups showing the highest yields. As a result, only these two compounds were taken forward to the next steps of the synthesis. Having served its purpose, the allyl group was now deprotected. This was carried out 
using tetricus triphenyl phosphine palladium and dimethyl barbituric acid. The palladium first activates the allyl group and allows it to be abstracted, together with the elimination of the product, which is protonated by the barbituric acid. This barbituric acid acts as the acceptor for the allyl group, which is eliminated and regenerates the palladium catalyst. This deprotected amine was not isolated and instead was directly reacted with the trichloroethyl sulfonyl protected amine chloride. This acts as a precursor to the guanidine group. This reaction formed the product in a 95% yield over two steps. This product was then reacted with ethyl triflate, which alkylated the carbamide oxygen. This was required for the next step of the synthesis, which was to finish the installation of the guanidine nitrogen atoms. Reaction with ammonia formed a hemiaminal type intermediate, which eliminated the ethoxide, forming the guanidine. A similar displacement also occurred at the thiomethyl group, and both nitrogen groups were introduced in a 68% yield. The more nucleophilic guanidine group, which is present in the six-membered ring, was then protected using troc benzamidazolium triflate. With all of the protecting groups now in place, the key oxidative dearomatization reaction was attempted. The initial attempts used diacetoxyiodobenzene and a rhodium carboxylate catalyst in a reaction that is very similar to the one we saw used in the total synthesis of haumine A. In this case, however, the authors found that higher yields were obtained by omitting the rhodium catalyst and instead using desmartin periodinane. We could propose the following mechanism for this transformation, basing it on mechanistic studies that have been carried out on the metal catalyzed version of this reaction. The amine first attacks the hypervalent iodine, and the displaced acetate then deprotonates the amine in a process that oxidizes it and eliminates another equivalent of acetate from the DMP reagent. This activated amine then undergoes a nucleophilic attack from the pyrrole group, forming the crucial bond between the C4 carbon and the guanidine nitrogen. The cationic intermediate produced by this reaction is then attacked by the displaced acetate and the nitrogen is protonated upon workup, producing the product in a 74% yield. Only one isomer of this compound was obtained, and we can attribute this to the concave nature of the six-membered ring, blocking the bottom face of the pyrrole, and this forces the acetate to add to only the top face. In order to carry out the desired mislow evans rearrangement, this acetate first had to be converted into a sulfoxide. Boron trifluoride was used to activate this acetate, which was eliminated, forming an aminium ion, in a manner similar to that seen in the glycosylation chemistry of acetate glycosyl donors. This aminium species was then attacked by thiophenol, forming the thioaminol, which was then oxidized with MCPBA in a 94% yield. Heating this sulfoxide with sodium thiolate triggered the mislow evans rearrangement. The oxygen of the sulfoxide group attacks the alkene, causing it to migrate, and results in the breaking of the carbon-sulfur bond. The thiolate then reacts with the sulfur atom, eliminating diphenyl disulfide, and produces the alcohol in an 80% yield upon workup. This was produced as a single isomer, as the rearrangement only occurs on one face of the ring. MCPBA was once again used in the next reaction, which first starts as a prilase of epoxidation. This reaction is the concerted addition of a peroxide to a nucleophilic alkene to form an epoxide. This epoxide was not isolated and instead underwent a rearrangement. In the compound bearing the terp-butyl dimethyl silyl group, the epoxide was first opened, forming an aminium intermediate, and then a 1-2 silyl shift was observed. This forms a ketone and produces a product with the silyl group still intact. However, in the compound bearing the dimethyl phenyl silyl group, a different reaction occurred. The authors have proposed two possible mechanisms for this reaction. In the first, the epoxide opens, as we saw before, and a nucleophile attacks a silyl group, and an enol is then formed, which taught him rises to the more stable ketone. Another possible mechanism for this reaction is a Brook rearrangement. In this pathway, the oxygen directly attacks the silyl group, forming a silyl enol ether, which can again undergo a tautomerization upon expulsion of the silyl group, forming the desired compound in a greater than 95% yield. With this ketone now in place, the authors set about functionalizing it. This proved to be a difficult task, 
as the molecule was quite sensitive to base and did not react favourably using Wittig reagents or organometallic nucleophiles. The researchers found that the best reactivity was obtained using a horner wadsworth emmons reaction. Triethylphosphonoacetate was first deprotonated with sodium hydride and this was then added to a solution of the ketone. In a mechanism similar to that of the Wittig reaction, it first undergoes nucleophilic addition to the ketone and the oxygen then attacks the phosphorus, forming a four-membered oxophosphatane intermediate. This then eliminated the phosphate and produced the alpha-beta unsaturated ester in a 37% yield, with a 3 to 2 E to Z ratio. With this in place, they could then isomerize it to form the ketone at the C12 position. The group developed reaction conditions that could carry out this isomerization in the same step as the deprotection of the primary hydroxyl group. This was carried out using tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride in acetic acid, which produced the product in a 73% yield, with a 3 to 1 ratio of C11 isomers, which matches that observed in the natural product. This is due to the highly enolyzable nature of this position, which will naturally equilibrate to form this ratio of isomers. In addition to this, they also formed a byproduct where the double bond had been isomerized to instead occupy the position between the C10 and C11 carbons. With the C11 functionalization now complete, they then sought about installing the pending carbamate group. The compound was reacted with carbonyl dimidazole. This reagent can be considered as an alternative to the more reactive but highly toxic phosgene. This is first attacked by the hydroxyl group and eliminates an imidazole. This is then reacted with ammonia, which eliminates the second imidazole group to provide the carbamate in a 54% yield. With this accomplished, the final deprotection was carried out. First, using hydrogen gas with palladium chloride and triphilic acid, and then hydrochloric acid in the second step. This deprotected the trot group, the trichloroethylsulfonyl group, hydrolyzed the ethyl ester, and also hydrated the ketone to form the gem diol. Overall, this produced the target 11 saxitoxin ethanoic acid in a 12% yield. That brings us to the end of this total synthesis. Next week, we will look at the total synthesis of calcipotriol.